Jesus, and Jesus. Wonderful to be with you. I woke up this morning with the mistaken impression I was in Chiang Mai, Thailand, but having drunk some coffee and rubbed the sand from my eyes, I can't tell you what a blessing it is to be with you here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Forgive me, most of my contact with Mennonites over the years has been with Mennonite missionaries in Israel. And of course, for reading things like the Martyr's Mirror, one of my favorite books, even though it was bigger than the Manhattan Yellow Pages. <laughs> I'm speaking here to missionaries. And you know, you don't speak to missionaries the way you speak to ordinary Christians. There are things that concern people who are missionaries or who are training to be missionaries that are important for you that may not be so important for other people. Missionaries. Quite a thing. We are all prisoners of culture and history to some degree. We have Hasidic Jews. They even look like the Pennsylvania Dutch, except they have these long ear curls called peot. And they try to take a religious model based on the shtetls, the ghettos of Eastern Europe in the 1700s, and impose it on the 21st century. Literally, that's their mind. They're trying to live in the 1700s, even though the year was 2016. There are Jewish cousins, my family. Then, of course, we have your Pennsylvania Dutch cousins who are the same thing. They are trying to live in the 1690s. <laughs> even though it's 2016, I was talking to your pastor and I watched a film made by an English producer of a Pennsylvania Dutch family who got born again, who got really saved and baptized again. And oh, Lord, what happened to that family in the community was unbelievable. It was so strict, couldn't work it out. When you go back to the foundations of the Mennonites, they were Anabaptists. They believed in believers' baptism. But when this family were born again and got baptized again, they thought they were heretics, but all they did was go back to what made a Mennonite a Mennonite. It's amazing how people can be blinded by culture and by history. They equate the two. They think their culture and their history is theology, but it's only sociology. You understand? They think it's theology, but it's only sociology. It's only the Word of God that endures forever. Amen. Why don't most Mennonites, there are exceptions, I've known Mennonite missionaries in Israel who were very aware of the last days. But why do most Mennonites not study eschatology or study end time prophecy? Why don't they do it? Well, let's go back to the beginning. You have to understand something about Mennonites. Again, they were an Anabaptist sect. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, you're okay there, but if you move this down to here, and we'll be Okay. Try that. Thank you. Sorry. Mennonites were an Anabaptist sect. You were not part of the Protestant Reformation. Your forebears, your ancestors, your forefathers were persecuted by Catholics and Protestants alike. Most of the time, going back to Menno Simons and the first Mennonites, they were basically trying to survive persecution most of the time. You should read the Martyr's Mirror if you haven't read it. That's your real heritage. The doctrines of the Mennonites were far better than the doctrines of Calvin or Luther or Zwingli or the Reformers. The Mennonites had the right doctrine in a number of ways. First of all, their faith was apostolic, not patristic. In other words, they went back only to the New Testament. They didn't accept the Church Fathers as authoritative and defining doctrine. Catholics and Protestants accepted the authority of the Church Fathers. The Mennonites only accepted what the Apostles wrote. Their faith was apostolic, not patristic. Secondly, they were not Erastian. They did not believe in a state church. Jesus said his kingdom was not of this world. They did not try to involve the body of Christ in the politics of the secular world. Bearing in mind that the aftermath of the Reformation, you had terrible wars between Catholic countries and Protestant countries and all this. People committing genocide in the name of Christ even, and the Mennonites didn't want to get caught up with this. Not least of all, they held to believers' baptism. 
They didn't believe you were a Christian by being sprinkled as a baby or being born into a church culture or a particular nation. They believed you had to be born again of God's spirit, be personally saved, then get baptized. You wouldn't put a baby in a coffin and bury it if it wasn't dead. Well, don't baptize somebody who's not a believer. That's what they believed. The doctrine of the Mennonites, of Menno Simons, were far better than anybody else at that time, generally speaking. Broadly speaking. They had the right doctrine. At least the forefathers had the right doctrine in many respects. But, again, we're terribly persecuted. Unfortunately, not all Anabaptists were like the Mennonites. There were other Anabaptists who were totally out to lunch. I don't know what they did with their brains, but nobody seemed to be able to find them. There was one named Severitus, who John Calvin burned in Geneva, and that was a mess. But not far from where your forefathers came from in Holland, there was a city in Germany called Munster. And there were these really crazy people called the Zwickau Prophets, or the Prophets of Zwickau, and they were out of their mind. They believed that because the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope would no longer stop the spread of the Gospel the way the Pope did in the Middle Ages, that it was the Millennial Kingdom of Jesus who come from Revelation chapter 20. The theological term is called over-realized eschatology, and the things they began doing were unbelievable. They began living not only communally, but they were practicing polygamy and all kinds of crazy things and immoral things that just were totally out of their mind. They thought it was the bloody old kingdom. They could be like Adam and Eve and run around naked in the street. That's just how crazy they got. Well, they gave all Anabaptists a bad name. They gave all Anabaptists a bad name. Much like today, there are moderate Pentecostals and moderate Charismatics who are not crazy, who are quite biblical. But you've got extreme elements that discredit the other ones. Very much the same kind of thing. And so, because these people who were talking about the return of Jesus the most were following these crazy false prophets from Munster, Germany, the Zwickau prophets, the Mennonites had enough on their plate. They were being so persecuted. Some of them eventually went to Pennsylvania, others went to Russia under Catherine the Great. She had an American boyfriend, the American Admiral John Paul Jones, and she was benevolent to your ancestors. I don't know if they have a the story. But at one time, many Mennonites were named their daughters Catherine in her honor because she <laughs> gave you refuge when other people were persecuted. But a lot of them went to Russia, a lot of them went to the Central America but to Pennsylvania. They had a lot in their place. So they had no time to think about end time prophecy. These people talking about end time prophecy were the crazy Anabaptists who were causing all the Anabaptists to be discredited. And that's what happened. As a result, we become prisoners of history. Because it was never emphasized in your history, to study the end times, the return of Jesus, it was never done. <clears throat> now, if we were to go back to the 1690s, it's reasonable why the followers of Menno Simons and the early Mennonites didn't want to focus on end time prophecy. It's understandable why they did it. Perfectly reasonable in the context of their historical situation. You can't fault them for it. On the other hand, that was the 17th century. We are in the 21st century. After salvation and conduit, no living, the blessed hope, the return of Jesus, his kingdom coming, is the third most spoken of subject in scripture as a whole. Only salvation and living morally gets more attention in God's word than the return of Jesus. That's quite a thing. Look with me, please, to the Olivet Discourse to Matthew chapter 24. Verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. 
Then the end will come. What is this gospel of the kingdom? The gospel is the gospel. God became a man, died for our sin. Took our sin to give us his righteousness and rose from the dead to give us eternal life. That through a saving faith in him we can have salvation. That is the gospel. But it's described in different ways and it is proclaimed in different ways throughout scripture. In both his first coming and his second coming, we see about an everlasting gospel being preached from the sky. We see that in the book of Revelation, and we see the angelic majesties doing it in the nativity. They said, we bring you glad tidings in Greek evangelio, good news. We bring you the gospel. Then we have the gospel of peace from Ephesians 6, Isaiah 52, the gospel of peace. Paul personalizes it, calls it his gospel. Here's the gospel of the kingdom. What is it? The gospel of the kingdom is what we see most clearly in Matthew, where Jesus spoke of hell three times as much as he did heaven. It's quite a thing for a missionary. Essentially, people who don't have regeneration are helped out. A sense of urgency in what you do. Thank God for a trauma surgeon saving lives, but you're saving souls. John the Baptist, Yohanan HaMatbil in Hebrew, preached the gospel of the kingdom. Repent, the kingdom is at hand. The gospel of the kingdom is where you use end time prophecy to engage people evangelistically. The western world, not Thailand, but the western world is post-Christian neo-pagan. Countries like Britain, America, Holland, they turn their back on their Judeo-Christian heritage. It's no longer a Judeo-Christian world. As missionaries, you need to understand this. Progressively, God is turning his grace from the developed world to the developing world. If you look at a map of Europe, it's gypsies and it's people in countries that didn't have the Reformation. The Catholic countries and the Eastern Orthodox countries where a lot of people get saved. It's Latin America, increasingly Asia, certainly, obviously, Korea, Philippines. Now it's beginning in Southeast Asia and in much of Africa. God is turning his grace from the white people to the dark complexion people, from the Protestant world to the Catholic world. Ultimately, we are told, he will turn his grace back to Israel and the Jews, his own people. That's the reality that you're going into as missionaries. You understand? By any reasonable barometer of church history, Protestantism is declining morally, theologically, spiritually, and doctrinally. It's committed suicide. The future of the church demographically will be in a developing world and in countries that didn't have a Protestant heritage. How do you evangelize people in a world like this? Well, they're going to the occult, they're going to astrologers, fortune tellers, God knows what else. They want to know the future. We know the future. You tell unsaved people. You see these events happening in the Middle East. Look what Jesus said. Luke 21, 24. You'll see Jerusalem trampled by the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is completed. Now he's specifically speaking about the Temple Mount, but since 1967, strategic control of Jerusalem is back in the hands of the Jews. Matthew 23, verse 39, Jesus makes it clear. He tells Jerusalem, he weeps over Jerusalem, and he tells them, you will not see me until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Jews must be back in Jerusalem for him to return. You see the Jews back in Israel, that's the beginning of the end. You see them in Jerusalem, it's getting closer. Not only that, the time of the Gentiles will come to a close. Jesus tells us that directly. So the time of the Gentiles is completed. Ethnon and Bethero are fulfilled. Paul uses the same terms in Romans 11, 25. He tells us. The natural branches will be grafted in again. The 
the first Christians were Jews, the last Christians will be Jews. Revelation 7. You know what I said? The first Christians were Jews. The last Christians will be Jews. My wife's family were Holocaust survivors. Most of them were murdered by the Nazis. My wife's parents, Christianity is a religion that put Jewish children in ovens in Auschwitz. That's what they thought of it. Yet, their daughter and their grandchildren, their own little grandchildren, grew up in Israel telling them, Saba, Safta, grandmother, grandfather, why don't you believe in our Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus? Only God can do that. It was the generation who survived the Holocaust whose children and grandchildren began turning back to Christ in significant numbers, unseen since the second century. The American College of Rabbis admits more Jews have come to faith in Jesus in the last 18 years than in the last 18 centuries. They said that 22 years ago. It's a lot more. Let no one mislead you. These things you see transpiring in the Middle East and the increased numbers of Jews you see coming to faith in Jesus show that the Lord is coming. But how can you as missionaries preach the gospel of the kingdom when you've never been told what it is? Again, I have in no way demeaning the very noble heritage of the Mennonites. I respect the heritage of the Mennonites. Menno Simons is one of my heroes. As I said, doctrinally, the Mennonites had it more right than the other than the Protestants. But let's understand certain things. You can't preach what you don't know. This week past, something happened. Russia began bombing targets in Syria with planes launched from Iran, the biblical Persia. After a major fallout, there's been a rapprochement between a fundamentalist Muslim government in Turkey and Putin. It makes no sense. Demographically, Russia is in trouble. The only sector of the Russian population that's growing are the Muslims. They've had terrible problems with Islamic fundamentalism themselves in Chechnya and theater takeovers in Moscow. Why would Putin be aligning himself with fundamentalist Muslims in Turkey and more so in Iran? It's like there's hooks in his jaw. That's what Ezekiel says. I will put hooks in your jaw. Why would an American government give $150 billion to a regime that's arming terrorists to kill Americans and a green light to develop nuclear weapons. Read Daniel chapter 10, that's why. That's all that. But again, most Mennonites have no background in these things. They may have heard about it, but the only Mennonites I know who really know about it are, are missionaries in Israel, to be honest with you. I'm not saying there aren't others, I'm just saying if there are, I've not met them. Turn with me, please, again to Matthew 24, the other discourse. Therefore, in verse 42, be on the alert. If you do not know which day or what is coming, he reiterates it. That's imperative. It's not an exhortation. It's a command. When you see these things happening, Jesus commanded us, didn't advise us, didn't encourage us. He said, be alert, watch out for these things. And the first thing he said to watch out for is deception. And the first deception is to think it's not important to understand them kind of things. And the day in which we live, you cannot do your job or fulfill your calling as evangelists don't understand the gospel of the kingdom. You cannot preach the gospel of the kingdom if you have never been taught what it is. How to use prophecy to engage people. But 
but it gets complex. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel Hanavi. The snap of the Babylonian captivity coming to an end. The hand of the Lord was upon me, he brought me out by the Spirit and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was filled with bones. He caused me to pass among them round about, and behold, there were many on the surface of the valley, and they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh, Lord God, you know. Again he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will breathe to enter you, cause breath to enter you. That you may come to life, and I will put sinews on you, make flesh grow back on you, cover your skin, and put breath in you so that you may come alive. <coughs> you know that I'm the Lord. So I prophesied, and I was commanded, and so I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone, and I looked, and behold, sinews were on them. Flesh grew, skin covered them. And he said to me, prophesy to the breath, and prophesy, son of man, and say, the breath, thus says the Lord, come forth the four winds, O breathe and breathe on these slain, they come to life. So I prophesied, and they came to life and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. And then God tells him, these bones are the whole house of Israel. As the nation of Israel was reborn after the Babylonian captivity, Ezekiel says it's going to happen again. But it gets complicated. We see these nations in the book of Revelation chapter 20 after the millennial reign of Jesus. Gog and Magog again. Well, Satan is temporarily released in Revelation chapter 20, verse 8. And he will come and deceive the nations that are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog. Are there two battles of Gog and Magog? Is there this one at the end of the millennial reign of Jesus, or is there also another one? This is the problem. The Western mind thinks of prophecy as a prediction and a fulfillment. Scripture does not. Prophecy is a pattern. Look with me to a very familiar prophecy about Jesus in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, one we all know. Yeshayahu Hanabi, Isaiah the prophet. For a child to be born to us, a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Haley Yoetz, Wonderful Counselor, El Gabor, God Almighty, Abi Ad, Eternal Father, and Sar Shalom, Prince of Peace. There'll be no end to the increase of his government or of his peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it in justice and righteousness. A son is born. It's a prophecy about his first coming, isn't it? Well, the government is not on his shoulder yet. The kingdom of this world is the kingdom of Satan. The world is in the hands of the wicked one. Notice it's prophesying about his first coming and his second coming in the same passage. In the Elevate Discourse, it's the same thing. Let us look. Go back again to Matthew 24. One Jesus came out of the temple, was going away, and his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him, and said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when these things will happen. What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus begins 
Jesuits by talking about things that were partially fulfilled in 70 AD. The prophet Daniel said the Messiah would come and die before the second temple would be destroyed. Jesus is echoing what Daniel said. Yet somehow these things happen at the end of the world, the end of the age. Again, speaks of his first coming and his second in the same passage. It's not always easy to work out. Of all people, John the Baptist couldn't work it out. Look with me, please, to Luke chapter 7. Verse 18, the disciples of John reported to him about all these things, summoning two of the disciples, and John said to them, to the Lord, saying, Are you the expected one, or do we look for someone else? They couldn't understand it. How come you haven't come and established the millennial kingdom? How come you didn't get rid of the Romans the way the Maccabees got rid of the Greeks? You see, on Palm Sunday, that's what they expected Jesus to do. They were singing Hosanna to him. Because when he came to the Golden Gate, the East Gate, they expected him to make a right turn and destroy the fortress Antonio, the seat of Roman government in Jerusalem, overshadowing the temple. They wanted him to come in and get rid of the Romans, the way the Maccabees got rid of the Greeks. Instead, he made a left and got rid of the word faith money preachers. The name of the famous crowd of the day. He kicked out Benny, Kenny, and Joyce. God is always much more concerned with the sin among his own people than he is with the sin of the world. He's more concerned with what's wrong in my life than in yours. That is what's wrong in the lives of those who are not saved. Until he gets us right, how much can he use us to get them right? And that's important for missionaries and for all of us to understand. Yeah. He's speaking about two different time frames. John the Baptist couldn't get it! Even after the resurrection, the apostles couldn't get it. Look at the book of Acts chapter 1. Verse 6, when they come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? When are you going to reign on the throne of David? When are you going to establish the millennial kingdom? Forget about this amillennial, amillennial post-millennial nonsense. It was an invention of the early church 300 years later. After Constantine pseudo-Christianized the Roman Empire that has spiritualized the way the millennium, but it's not what the early Christians believed. The original plan God had for man and for the planet still has to happen. The plans of God cannot be thwarted by the sin of man or the designs of Satan. What would have happened if Adam and Eve had not sinned? That's what the millennium is going to be like. The original plan God had still has to happen. That's what the early church believed. What would have happened if Israel accepted the Messiah instead of rejecting it? That's what the millennium is going to be like. Related but separate subject, I only mention it quickly. In passing, nonetheless, the apostles couldn't get it. John the Baptist, his own cousin, none born among women is greater than John, but he didn't get it. His own apostles, after three and a half years with him, and probably sometime with John before that, some of them, they didn't get it. So if you don't get it, you're in good company. But we should get it. Let me explain the basis of the return of Jesus, okay? What the Jews believe, not the Jews today, the Judaism you see today is Talmudic Judaism. It's not real Judaism, it is rabbinism. It is no more the Judaism of Moses and the prophets than the Roman Church is the Christianity of Jesus and the Apostles. It's a counterfeit Judaism. I mean real Judaism. The Old Testament, the Tanakh, as they call it. Anyway. There are two pictures of the Messiah. Two. And the rabbis admit this. In Hebrew they're called Hamashiach ben Yosef. Messiah, son of Joseph, and Hamashiach, and David, the Messiah, the son of David. 
the rabbis somehow vaguely understand that the Messiah is prefigured. There's a picture of him in Joseph from the book of Genesis. It is providential that Jesus' foster father's name was Joseph. Yosef in Hebrew, Yahweh Shalat. The rabbis know that Joseph somehow is a picture of Jesus, or of the Messiah, not Jesus. But then there's Hamashiach ben Nabi, Messiah, son of David. The conquering king. Lord, is it this time you're going to restore the kingdom? When are you going to rule the nations with the rod of iron? When is the government going to be on your shoulders and we will not need politicians anymore? What's going to happen? In order for Jesus to be the Christ, Yeshua must be the Mashiach. And for Yeshua to be the Mashiach of the Jews, he has to fulfill all the Old Testament prophecies. Both the son of Joseph ones and the son of David ones. Otherwise, he's not the Messiah. But he is the Messiah. In his first coming, he fulfilled the son of Joseph prophecies. In his second coming, he fulfills the son of David prophecies. Let me explain. In your mind's eye, go with me back to the book of Genesis to Joseph, the beloved son of his father, who his father sent to seek the welfare of his brothers and they rejected him. Joseph was betrayed by his Jewish brothers into the hands of the Gentiles. God took that betrayal and turned it around and made it a way for all Israel and all the world to be saved. So Jesus, the son of Joseph, was betrayed by his Jewish brothers into the hands of the Gentiles. And God took that betrayal by his own and he turned it around and made it a way for all Israel and all the world to be saved. Joseph was condemned with two criminals. And as Joseph prophesied, one will live, one will die. And so Jesus, the son of Joseph, was condemned with two criminals. And as he prophesied, one will live. This hour he will be with me in paradise. One will die. They brought Joseph's cloak to prove he was not in the pit, as they brought Jesus' shroud to prove he was not in the tomb. However, Joseph went to the place of condemnation to a place of exaltation in a single day, and every knee had to bow to him. So the Lord Jesus, the son of Joseph, from a place of condemnation to a place of exaltation, in a single day, every knee shall bow to the son of Joseph. Joseph was betrayed by his brother Yehuda, Judas, for 20 pieces of silver. After inflation, Jesus was betrayed by his brother Yehuda, Judas, for 30 pieces. Upon exaltation, Jesus does something. He does what Joseph did. Once exalted, Joseph takes a Gentile pride. Upon exaltation, Jesus, the son of Joseph, takes a Gentile bride to church. It was on and on and on like this. On and on. Details are incredible. Not coincidental. But Joseph's brothers, Jews, did not recognize him at the first coming. They recognized him at the second, and they wept bitterly. Turn with me, please, to the Hebrew prophet Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 10. The 
Let's look at this one, first of all. The burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Thus declares the Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundations of the earth, forms the spirit of man within him. I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all people around about. And when the siege is against Jerusalem, it will be against Judah. The real issue in the Middle East will not be the final status of the West Bank or of the Golan Heights, or of the Gaza Strip, it'll be the final status of Jerusalem. That's where Satan got his biggest defeat, and that's where he will get his final defeat. It's a war cause. Who's responsible for this turmoil in the Middle East? Well, obviously the devil has a hand in it, obviously it's Islam, obviously it's a lot of things. But ultimately, it's the Lord's hand. In verse 10, I'll pour it on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. They'll look upon me who they have pierced, crucified, and mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over the firstborn. Joseph's Jewish brothers did not recognize him at the first coming. They recognized him at the second and went bitterly. This one we rejected and betrayed is the one who's saving us. And so Jesus, the son of Joseph, his Jewish brothers don't recognize him at the first time. They recognize him at the second. And they weep bitterly. This one we rejected and betrayed is the one who's saving us. Hamashiach ben the He's the Messiah, the son of Joseph. He's the Messiah, the son of David. Remember, Joseph, when he revealed himself to his Jewish brothers, what did he do first? He sent his Gentile servants away, didn't he? He sent them out of the room in the book of Genesis. Jesus is going to send his Gentile servants away, the rapture and resurrection. He's going to turn his grace back to Israel and the Jews and personally reveal himself to them. The stage is being set for these events as we speak. There have been other times in history, including in the days of Meno Simons, when believers, true believers, thought it was the last days. It's happened several notable times in history when Christians thought it was the last days. But there was always a missing ingredient. Believers in England thought Napoleon was the Antichrist. There were some believers who thought Mussolini was the Antichrist in the 1930s. During the Crusades, people thought that was the end of the days. The prophecies were being fulfilled. These things have happened before. But there was always something missing. There was always one piece of the puzzle that wasn't there the other times Christians thought it was the last days. What was missing then? Were my children born in Galilee. Saba, Saba, why don't you believe in our Messiah, Yeshua? That was missing for centuries. But it's not missing now. They are back in that land, and they are turning to Christ in numbers not seen since the second century. The rabbis even live The kingdom, my friends, is coming. You as missionaries cannot be equipped to be missionaries in the days in which we live unless you understand the basis, at least the basis, of end time prophecy. Now remember, the return of Jesus depends on God's prophetic purposes for two people. The faithful church, the true church, and Israel and the Jews. In the last days, Satan will try desperately to destroy both. He will not succeed, but he will try desperately. Satan must do everything he can to get the Jews out of Israel, and particularly out of Jerusalem. And he'll use politicians, the UN, Islam, or anything else. He will not succeed, but he will try. 
God can make God whatever it is. You know? I want you to think about something, and I'm not trying to be melodramatic. Understanding your facts. It's something I think about almost every day. You or I could have been born a hundred years ago or five hundred years ago. If God wanted us to be born, he could have put us here centuries ago. Generations ago. We were not only born at this time, we were born again at this time. We were born at this time by the will of God and we were born again at this time by his grace. Every time I brush my teeth or try to shave, I look at this guy in his mirror. And I say to myself, Lord, if I was going to send somebody to prepare the way for the return of your son, I could do a lot better than that clown. <laughs> Why do you pick me to put me here at this time? I'm not proud of it, but before I was saved, I was a communist when I was in university. Then I was a cocaine addict and a drug dealer. Why me before Jesus saved me? I'm not proud of it, believe me. I've got friends that were dead, and as far as I know, in hell because of those things. It's only by the grace of God I'm not there with them. Why me? But why you, even though you're nice and nice? Why did he put you here at this time? Why were you born at this time, and born again at this time, to prepare the way for his son to return? Why has he called you to a mission field? Why has he called you to be a missionary? I don't know. I don't suppose I'm going to find out until he gets here. But who am I to argue with him? By his unmerited grace, he chose me, and he chose you. Not just to be saved, but to be saved at this particular time. We need to prophetic events on him for me. There are two things I would tell my Mennonite brethren. One is to read the Martyr's Mirror. Read where you came from. Because if you don't know where you came from, you won't know where you're going. Read the Martyr's Mirror. Understand your own history and heritage. That's the first thing I would tell my men and my brethren in Jesus. The second thing I would tell them is this. This is the 21st century, not the 17th. Things that might not have been as important in the days of mental science are important now. They're important for all of us. And they're certainly empirically My dear Mennonite friends, my brethren, I love you in Christ and I respect the heritage of your ancestors. I truly do. I truly do. Reading the Martyr's Mirror had an impact on me like few things have other than Scripture itself. I esteem your heritage. But let us make no mistake. A heritage means nothing if you don't live up to it. The most precious of things become abject if we don't live up to it. The second thing I would tell you, once again, in conclusion, the 21st century is not the 17th. Let us make no mistake about it. Jesus is coming soon. God bless and thank you. Will you give us the blessing in Hebrew? I will do that! And the Lord spoke to Aaron, to his brothers, and said, Thus you shall say and bless the sons of Israel. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his grace shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. So you shall bless the sons of Israel, and then I will bless them. <laughs> Ela I'm
ויעשה לך שלום. יברך אדוני וישמרך, יאר אדוני פניו אליך ויחוניך. יישא אדוני פניו אליך ויעשה לך שלום. בשם ישוע המשיח, in the name of the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, שלום.